Good morning, friend. I was just speaking to the pastor just now. It, it's such a privilege to come in these little havens of rest like this. You just feel like, well, just sitting down and listening to the services. And, and there's something about this little spot. I said to my son coming around at the building a few moments ago that you just look like uh, just, uh, I just like to come here and sit down and just listen a while. Listen to what others has got to say. We ministers know that that's a great time for us. Usually we're always having to do the talking. Somebody listening to us. But we like to sit down and listen to you. you got a fine pastor in this lovely little uh, choir here. And the songs of Zion. The place is just pretty and not too elaborate. It's just... just what we call homey. And so I, I like that real well. God ever richly bless you all. I was a uh, thought in my heart to hear this little sister here a while ago, uh, 65 years of service for the Lord. I thought I was about old enough to quit, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> Actually, here's someone been serving 65 years. That would be about... Well, I guess about 12, 14 years before I was born, she was serving. So that's wonderful. I was speaking uh, at a funeral service the other day for a little old lady that, uh, about 85 years old, that went to meet the Lord. And, and she was a sweet little old woman. You've read my life story the, where I asked the boy if he'd save me that uh, suit, you know, that... Uh, he had one of these little Boy Scout suits, and I always wanted to be a soldier. So I asked him if he'd save it for me after he wore it out, and he promised he would. And when I went to get it, he only had one legging left, and that was I wore that legging to school. And it was um, that was his mother that just passed away, Miss Ford. And they're among the poorest of poor people. Lloyd, the boy who gave me the legging, we've been chums since the little boys. He's just a little older than I. And I said to him, Lloyd, what would you want me to take the, the funeral text from? And he said, Brother Billy, he said, just, I, I would like for you to speak this, if it's the will of the Lord, just some assurance that my mother will be back again. I said, very well. So I took the text from over in Job. If a man die, shall he live again? And I take it from the, I believe, Job 14, I think it is. And how Job seen the, how the botany life, when it died, it lived again. So I took the subject of anything that lives to the will and purpose of God as a resurrection. And being a missionary and traveling the world, I've had the privilege of seeing many gods in their the philosophies of life and what people worship. And uh, in all of it, that's about all it is, a philosophy outside of Christianity. Christianity has the truth. Now, we know that this world is a creation. And before there can be a creation, there has to be a creator of that creation. And this creator expresses himself in the creation. If we did not even have a Bible, we would still know that at, their, at the truth, just as we do. This Bible only sets in order. Now, God creating the creation is expressing himself back in the creation, and he's not a God just of one solid uh, Sears and Roebuck harmony house. He, he, he's a God of variety. He makes big hills and little hills, and he makes the deserts, and, and he makes lakes, and he makes the little trees and yeah. big trees yeah. and white flowers and red flowers and he makes the little man and big man and red-headed women and black-headed women and he makes us different because he wants us that way. He's a God of variety. And he makes some rich and some poor, some in between. But we've got a place to serve God and that's the place that he's placed us in yeah. if we'll just abide in that place. And I said, now, if you watch the little flower... This was along about October. I said, the seeds, we've had frost now, and, and they knocked the little seeds out and uh, 
flower died and little seeds turned back to the earth. And uh, God's having a funeral service in these fall rains. These just great big drops of tears dropping from the skies, burying it. And coming up through Kentucky, I said the other day, up on the big chest of the mountains, he set out his bouquets across the earth. The leaves, red, brown, yellow, see? And he's in bereavement uh, because the little seeds is dead and he's burying them beneath the ground. And he knows just as sure as that earth comes back around with the line of the sun again, Every one of them arise again. But it's just a routine he goes through to speak to us that there is a resurrection. Now we notice the sun. It's born of a morning. And it's a little baby when it's born. It's supposed to warm the earth and resurrect the seeds that's in the ground. And that at about 8 o'clock, it starts off the grammar school. And about 10 or 11 o'clock, it's out. It's got its education. At noontime, it's in its middle age. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's striking my age. Five o'clock, it's my father's age, sister back there. And after a while, that glorious thing that lit up the earth, served God's purpose, dies out in the west. Is that the end of it? It's born to me. It rises up the next morning again. See? God in every phase, I talk about 20 minutes just explaining what all that was. Now, you see then, I said, why? There's one requirement. And I love to say this in a church like this. There's one requirement that's required there. No matter how beautiful the seed is, it must be germatized. Amen. It's got to be germatized. And if it does serve God's purpose, it is germatized because the bee packs the pollen and so forth. Now we find out, what if the little lily, if it's uh, pretty, tall day and night, opened up its little self and... The bee come by and just tuck its honey just as free as anything. Didn't say a word about it. And it toiled just to give out its honey. And then the passerby sees its beauty. It just keeps itself pretty so the passerby can see it loves beauty. The one who desires its fragrance breathes it in freely. And the little lily toils just to make itself benefit on the earth. See? To produce honey, beauty, and funeral flower, whatever it chews for, wedding flower. Anything, it just gives its little self freely. And when it dies, it rises up again next year. Hallelujah. Everything. What if a little stalk of corn would say, I'm so sorry, there's nothing pretty about me. And I didn't have no honey to give out. I didn't have this, that, that. But then the master of all of it would say, yes, but the little lily couldn't make cornflakes either. <laughs> we, all, we all have a, a thing that we do. We serve God in the category that we're putting and it comes back just the same. Now, in the face of all that, I said, here's little Mother Ford as I know her. She washed my little dirty face when I was a little kid and many times. It was as poor as poor could be. But she was born a female, a lovely girl. And if she's born a female, that was for a purpose, to have a mate, a male. And she did. A loyal mate she was. She lived with her husband for some 60 years or better, and a loyaler woman wasn't born, as I know of. A real lady. Being that she was that in the union, they were to have children. Here's her nice, fine children sitting here. Just as lovely. You children would never want a better mother, or would you? No. Her husband could not want a better wife. Now, I said she was as poor as poor could be, but nobody could ever come to her door or need but what she'd give to them. The neighbors, no matter what trouble they was in, Miss Ford, any hour of the night, was there to help them do anything she could with what she had to do with. And I said, above all that, I had the privilege one time of seeing that seed germatized by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. She was born again of the Spirit of God. And I said, now we are going to plant her in a little bit in the ground. And who intelligently could stand up and say she will not rise again? If you say she won't rise again, the leaf didn't go down to the bottom of the tree before the frost fell to hide itself, to come back next year with a new leaf. If that, that sap stayed up in that tree until the frost and freeze hit that, it would kill that germ of life and that sap, and the tree would die. But some intelligence that has none of its own, that's botany life. It has no intelligence, but something controls it. Before we have a frost or anything in that country... Way in August, them leaves 
go off the tree because the sap leaves the tree and goes back down into the roots way beneath the ground to hide that germ of life to bring it back again next year with some more fruit. Hallelujah. What does that? What intelligence? That same intelligence controls our life. That's right. And before we can say there's no resurrection for a little saint like that sitting there that served God 65 years, I was thinking of her laying there, that oxygen tent, her breath just coming. My, she'll rise again someday. She's just got to, that's all. Before you could say she would not, you'd have to say there is no springtime. There is no resurrection of the seas. There is no summer and winter. There is no rising and setting of the sun. There is no such a thing as the Word of God. Why, it would be crazy to say such a thing. There is a resurrection. Amen. Amen. And just as sure as that world floats around, around in face of this sun again, that sun will is give com commission by God to raise up with his warm rays that bodily life. And just as soon as time floats around to eternity breaks again, and that S-O-N rises out there. Hallelujah. Something's going to happen. <laughs> All them lives that's germatized in him will rise again. It's just got to. There's no way of any other way. See the creator expressing himself in his creation? See, that's what God's doing. And we can look out. Anybody that's, that's half intelligent could look out and see that God, the Christianity, is based upon resurrection. Hallelujah. Now, if I drop this piece on the floor, now it went down. And I come over here and pick up something similar. Now, that isn't resurrection. That's replacement. But resurrection is to bring this same one up. Amen. Amen. And we're coming back again. Amen. You plant a yellow grain of corn, it'll produce another yellow grain of corn. See? And we go down a mortal, raise up an immortal. And we're so glad of that today. And that's our whole Christian Hallelujah. hope is Hallelujah. built right there. Right there alone. So to come together and sit in heavenly places like this in Christ Jesus, what a privilege it is to all of us, young and old, looking for that time when Jesus shall come. Now, with a congregation like this and the Spirit of God in here the way it is, I could speak on till 9 o'clock tonight or 8 o'clock time to go down to the four square church and still be feeling good. <laughs> But we got to give away. They don't want the beans to scorch and so forth, you know. So we um, just come in for a little time of fellowship and be here with this lovely brother and his little flock that you're sojourning here. And we come in to share under your tree <laughs> to sit down and have a little fellowship. So let's read some word out of God's Bible and take just a little text and, and speak for a few moments. Before we do that, let's just bow our heads and speak to the author of this before we approach his word. Amen. I wonder now with our heads bowed, if there would be a request somewhere in the building that you'd want to make mention of before God, you keep it in your heart and just raise up your hands just a moment. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed a privileged people this morning in the face of this changing world. And we have the hold of the hand of the unchangeable God. Times may change, but He's eternal. And His Word is in our heart. It's uh, an ultimate of our, of our thoughts. They always drift back to that Word. No matter where we stray, it comes back to the Word. It's the tie post in our heart. We're so grateful for that. I thank Thee, Lord, for this little spot out here on 44th Street where the gospel being preached and uh, a place that's dedicated and uh, the people are consecrated to Thee. And I pray that Your blessings will ever be with them, increase them, and knowledge of thy word and of thy grace and give to them the good things of life and eternal life that we might all come to one place, that great heaven someday uh, when Jesus comes. Bless us together and look at those hands, Father, that was raised a few moments ago. Down beneath that hand was a, a reason for its being up. 
I pray, God, that he who knows the secrets of the heart will grant that request. I offer my prayer with theirs upon thy altar today. Answer, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Bless the words this morning, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to thee. Bless thy word as we read it, and the little uh, notes of context that we would explain it, you be with us and help us that when we leave here, we might go and say, our hearts burn within us, because we've heard the songs of Zion, the testimony of the heart, and the word testified to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, many times, uh, I just love to talk, and I can't do too much of it, it being almost 12 now. And so, we are going to ask you maybe to turn in the Scriptures, if you would like to, to read the Scriptures with us or mark it down. First, I want to read out of the book of Proverbs. I believe that I turned to that this morning and when I was searching around, uh, Proverbs 18th chapter and um, the 10th verse. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. And then in Isaiah 32, 2, I want to read this, 32, 1 and 2. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. And a prince shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Uh, this might seem like a very uh, odd text to uh, draw this conclusion from, but I want to take the subject this morning of letting off pressure. It seems very fitting in this day. And I was up late last night, and, and about around between 12 and 1 o'clock, I was, was trying to think, now, where do I go in the morning? And they told me, up to that a little church of God that you thought was so pretty up there on 44th Street or Avenue, whichever it is. And I said, oh, I remember that. And I thought, what will I say? I said, well, now, I remember the last time there, I just felt so at home, <laughs> just relaxed. And I thought that would be a good text, just let off the pressure. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, speak on from that little church in the morning. And now, and I jotted down a few little notes here that I might comment on for a few moments. And we're living in a day of much pressure. Everywhere, yeah. everybody's so tense and down the street with the hot rod and they can't wait for the stoplight, and, you know, and run over you. And, uh, and they're not going anywhere. Not at all. Not going. They're just as hard as they can race, but just racing towards eternity is all I know. And they, and you have to watch this way and that way. And 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 then it's uh, I said there's just two classes of people live down there, and that's the quick and the dead. And, <laughs> damn it, ain't quick, <laughs> die quick. I, <laughs> and I, I my dangerous to be safe these days. <laughs> Hurrying, racing, temper, oh my. A uh, poor little lady yesterday, I, Brother Williams, I guess, wasn't noticing it, but we was going to make a turn. We went to see his son, and he wasn't home, and we were making a turn, and some little lady, we have to allow for that, she made a, a kind of a little bobble, and why, well, anybody ought to have to be gentle enough to say, it's all right, madam. Go ahead. It's all right. But she happened to turn on the left, turn in front of some fella, and oh my. 
And his face was as red, and he had the window down, just uh, saying everything. Of course, the little lady was just pushing up her hair and going on. <laughs> <laughs> And he stopped right in the street and was almost holding us up, you see, just to get the ball her out. Oh, it's a terrible time, isn't it? Where are we going? What's the hurry? We used to drive a little horse around the corner, take her time. Lived a lot longer. And we're the same kind of people. And there we are. Oh, everybody smoking a cigarette. Just, just a puffing it. Down in Tucson last week, I noticed the children standing, a little girl, pretty little thing. She was about 10 years old, and she, her little cheeks was all sunken in, and her little dark hair, a lovely-looking little fella, and she was standing around uh, smoking a cigarette before she went in. Now, that child probably had TB, maybe just a nervous wreck. Now, perhaps the reason she smoked, her mother smoked before. I was at the World's Fair this year, and I guess many of you were, and I enjoyed one thing. That was the medical room. And when they were there proving what smoking does, they had this Yule printer, and, and I, you were there, noticed it, and they took a cigarette and put it on a... A thing and pull the smoke out and strode it across a white piece of marble and wipe that nicotine up with a piece of cotton and put it on a rat's back and in seven days there's so much cancer the rat couldn't even walk from the nicotine of one cigarette. Then the doctor said, you've heard people say, and he turned it around and put it under a tube and let the smoke be pushed up through some kind of chemicals, and there was a white streak. He said, there is the cancer. Then he said, you've heard people say, I don't inhale it. So he pulled it in his mouth like that, puffed it in, and then put his mouth on this tube and blowed it up, and there was hardly any in it at all. So said, where is the cancer? In my mouth. I swallow it down through my throat, picks up my throat, and goes into the stomach. And then that was the world's best, remember. And then he goes ahead and says, the people say, use a filter tip. You've heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, a thinking man's smoke or some kind of slogan. <laughs> if the man thinks at all, he won't smoke at all. <laughs> it's not a thinking man. It's an unthinking man would smoke one. But uh, he... Pull this tobacco, he said, now you see the only thing it is, is the public is not smart enough to catch this, and yet we're supposed to be intelligent people. He said, if you get no smoke, you get no results. And when you've got smoke, you've got to have tar to get smoke, and tar is worth cancer lays. It takes tar to make smoke. And said the only thing, it was smoking them with the tips on them. You smoke about three to get the satisfaction of one. The other time, you got the same amount in you exactly. See, an American public wants to rabbit out a hat. They got it. Mm. Right. There you are. See? And then when they brought that rat out, they had brought one out every seven days. It was the most hideous looking sight I ever seen. There's a great big fellow sitting by me. So sweat running off of me. He said, very striking. I said, do you smoke? He said, yes. <laughs> there you are. But yet, we go right on doing it. Why? We're trying to find something to quieten. Some uh, anesthetic. It seems like the world's in a breakneck speed, and I don't know what, they're, what they mean. But there is a Christian anesthetic. There is a, the opium comes from a lily. And the Christian church has some opium, and it's from the lily of the valley. <laughs> Soothes all the pains, and it's all over then. When you get this Christian opium, this new wine that they had on the day of Pentecost, see, it soothes out the pain. People so arrogant. And they're doing things that they ought not to do instead of trying to get rid of the cause 
They're just putting another cause with it. Right. You can never uh, find the cure until you get rid of the cause. Man is trying to find something to satisfy, and he thirsts, and God made him to thirst. That's, he was built up that way. But God built him that way so he'd thirst after him. But he tries to satisfy it and hush that holy call in him with things of the world. And we have no right to do that. Right. Now, but people do wrong constantly. Instead of going to the place to get rid of the cause, we try to hush it with anesthetics and liquor and smoking and, and putting more to it, heaping it up all the time, making it worse. And all this only builds up pressure. Amen. It just makes it worse all the time. Not long ago, I, you all, all of you perhaps know that I do a lot of target shooting and hunting. That's what I have as a hobby. Some brother had sent over to, to Weatherby Company and had taken a, a Model 70 Winchester, as some of my hunting partners in here would know, and it was reboard to a Weatherby Magnum 257, Art Wilson. Give Billy Paul the gun, and he's left-handed, and it had a bolt, and he just gave it to me. And another fellow come in and said, you haven't got no Weatherby, so I'll rebore it for you. And in reboring it, they didn't want to admit it, but they didn't rebore it right. And what they did, back, you hand loaders know, that back behind the ring, it was getting pressure. And when I fired a few rounds of shells in it, I noticed the primer was pulling back. And there's a pressure. Well, I know the shell was absolutely loaded under the maximum load. So it couldn't have been getting pressure from that, but it wasn't bored right. And the next shell that laid up uh, hadn't been for God I lost my life. It just, the whole gun exploded and blowed the trees out around me like that. And by as high as this feeling, red fire blew and the rifle barrel went out on the 50 yard range and the boat went over my head back this way. The scope exploded that close to my eyes and, and I didn't have nothing in my hand. It's blowed up. Blood spurting every way from around me and was way away from a doctor and they see me and I couldn't speak or anything. And I was holding the blood in like this. I tuck it away and just spurt all over a brother stand there and I put it back. I said, Lord Jesus, in my heart, you are my healer. I took my hand down and it was quit. So what was the matter? The gun was trying to shoot a shell that wasn't actually made for the gun. If the gun had been built up from the beginning, a Weatherby Magnum, it would not have blown up. But it was trying to put a Weatherby shell and a Winchester rifle. And it won't work. Right. And you see these scars around here and over my eyes and 15 pieces went just below the sight. When the doctor looked in my eye, he wrote back to my friend, the doctor. He said, the only thing I know that God was sitting on that bench with his servant. That man was with him out of calling the shots just ought to have found from his waist down. Said God was with him. And said the shot, the, the pieces of the primer, Put 15 pieces plumb behind the eyeball, uh, just under the sight. Never bothered me one bit. Two or three days after her face looked like hamburger, it was all dried up and gone. But what was it? It was because that it was a shell in a gun that it wasn't made for. Right. It had built up pressure. Now, if the gun had been made and in this uh, holder... Uh, where the shell slipped in from the magazine into the barrel, the chamber, if that chamber had been made correctly, it would have helped the pressure. And the pressure goes out this way. But instead, it was loose. And that pressure, the shell being weaker than the barrel, of course, it blew this way and blew the gun back this way. The barrel wasn't hurt. This blew it off, of course, it's completely tore everything from around it. It could not be used no more, but it, the hollow was still sticking in the barrel. See, it wasn't. Now, if it had been an overloaded shell, it would have burst the barrel. 
But you see, in here, the thickest part of the gun, it blew back this way and knocked the lock loose. Now, if it had been built up a Weatherby Magnum, it would have never blown up. It was trying to put something in something that didn't belong there. That's the way of a Christian experience. When people are trying to put a cold, formal confession into a powerful, Pentecostal church or experience, unless that person is built from ground up, built up, born again, regenerated, impersonators of the day, going around, trying to impersonate speaking in tongues, trying to impersonate this and impersonate that, the gifts. If they are not born again, and if they are born again, they cannot impersonate because they were built for those things. They're born, regenerated, remolded. Not just something that's patched up and shook hands and got emotion and danced around the altar a few times and says, I got it. It's something that's been remolded and regenerated and become a new creature. They can stand the pressure of the persecution and the things that follows the spiritual life. You've got to be made and built to stand the pressure. And only one thing can do it. That's when you come into God's molding house. Amen. And be torn down and rebuilt a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I was at the hospital here not long ago, and uh, I was going to pray for a lady. And there was another lady laying next to her. And I seen her all nervous, and I began to talk about prayer. And I said, well, we are bowing heads for prayer. I said, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Pull that curtain. I said, Yes, ma'am. I said, I was only going to pray. And she said, pull that curtain. I said, yes, ma'am. Aren't you a believer? And she said, we are Methodists. I said, well, that certainly expresses what I asked. (laughs) Yeah. I never asked her what lodge she belonged to. I asked her if she was a believer. (laughs) All these lodges get us all mixed up. You cannot join church. There is no such a thing. You can join the lodge. You can join the Methodist lodge, the Baptist lodge, the Presbyterian lodge, or the Pentecostal lodge. But you can't join the church. You've got to be born. That's really got so much blow up. See? The pressure builds, and there you go. You say, well, I belong to this, but that doesn't mean you've got to come up from the ground up to stand the pressure of this day. When God puts His big charge of the Holy Spirit in there, you better know what you're doing. <laughs> you better be ready for it. Now, if you if you kind of rebore out something and say, I tear it all night for a gift, you better be careful. <laughs> it might explode. <laughs> and it'll backfire. Coming to a hospital thought, I was coming down one night and and there was uh, sent me his brother Neville, the pastor's call, and I I, did, I took it because I was coming from Louisville and it said the lady was very serious and I went out to the hospital there at Jeffersonville and there, there was a, a lady there and I, they told me to go to room 322. The lady was there. I walked in. I said, um, uh, is there a four-bed ward? And I said, is there a lady so-and-so here? No, sir. She isn't here. I said, uh, I probably made a mistake. Excuse me. And I walked back out, and the nurse was coming down the hall. And she was kind of hurry. I said, lady, could you tell me if a certain lady is up here on this ward or where she's at? She said, I have no time for to do things like that. Then can't you see I'm in a hurry? I said, pardon me. I walked up to the desk, and... And the lady was sitting there at the desk, a nurse, and I said, uh, she's writing out something. I kept waiting. She looked up at me and just kept on writing. Well, I waited around a few minutes, and I said, good evening. She never said a thing. And I thought, well, I said, could you tell me where a certain lady is? At, uh, I'm a minister. I've been sent here to a certain place, to room 322, they told me. 
And she said, well, I can go to room 322. I said, uh, lady, I have uh, uh, been to room 322. She said, why ask me then? Go to the desk downstairs. I said, well, thank you. I started downstairs and I got down there and I asked the nurse on the floor if she knew nothing about it. And here come a little doctor down the, through the floor with his stereoscopes in his hand, whirling them around and around like this. Little, I never seen such a fat man. He was, he was honestly, I believe he's broader than he was long. He was walking, or uh, he was high rather. So he is walking down, whirling these stereoscopes in his hands, and I said, um, "Excuse me, doctor, could you tell me where?" I said, "Yes, yes, just going back that way." <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I went on down the other way, and I thought, "Well, now, what am I going to do?" And he went down and sat down behind the desk, and I didn't see anybody else. I thought I might as well walk up and ask him again. I said, pardon me, sir. He just kept looking at something else, you know, and I said, Did, um, uh, I am uh, wanting to know where uh, the room said this back that way. I said, room uh, 222, I can't find which way to go. He said, just go this way and that way. You'll find it. <laughs> what is it? Pressure. See? Pressure built up. He might have come from surgery. He might have thought that he had, uh, I ought to be asking him that. It was out of the visiting hours, truly. But uh, he thought, just some preacher let him go, see. The world's just built up on pressure. It's going to blow up one of these days. The world built full of pressure, and the doctors don't know what to do about it. The psychiatrist has got psychiatrist doctor them. Right. They don't have the answer. But God does. Right. Amen. God has the answer to all of this. In the Old Testament, when a man had did something wrong, now it was tooth for tooth and eye for eye. And if this man did something wrong, he had a place of escape. I believe Joshua had built houses of refuge. And if the people did something wrong and they were subject to be killed, but they had a place of refuge where this man could run to this city of refuge and he was safe if his pursuers didn't overtake him before he got there. He, but if the pursuers overtook him, they, they killed him in the way. But if he got there and if he had did this crime not willingly, and could plead his case and show that he, he was sorry that he did it, then he could be brought into this city of refuge and the pursuers could not enter the city. No, he, had, he was safe. What a feeling that must have been. To know that you did something that, that was wrong, and you know it was wrong, but there is a place Amen. where you won't have to worry no more. Go into this place and are safe. Now, if the man willfully did it, oh, then he, had to, he, he couldn't come in. If he had willfully committed a murder, his trial was tried at the gate. And that's, but the man who wanted and had not willfully did it, just like I'd give a type of it. If a man's done wrong and he really wants, he, he's sorry that he sinned, there is a place of refuge. Yes, amen. But if he just don't care, then there's no place for him because he won't accept it. It's done mean he wanted to. No um, chance for them, and that's the same as it is today. And then the thing was, if he had did wrong, he must want a place of refuge. Yes. He must want to be there. And that's a very good type of the church today and the people. A man's got to want a place of refuge. Yes, amen. You've got to feel your need of it. Amen. But if you think amen. you want to fight your own battles, go ahead. See? But you're sure to be caught by your pursuers. But someday it's going to find you. But if you want a place, and then when the man wanted a place and found a place, he must be willing to stay there. Amen. You don't go out no more. You stay there. Amen. Then you're safe while you're there. Hallelujah. Oh, what a relief that must Amen. have been. 
to find a place as soon as you enter the gates and the gates closed behind you, I'd be satisfied. <laughs> yes, sir, he must want to stay there. No complaining. Walk around saying, oh, why did they ever come in here? Now, that's just the way people does today. They say they want to be free from uh, the cares of the world. And then they get in to the, amongst the believers. And then they say, now, if I'm going to have to give this up, if I'm going to have to do that, if I'm going to have to pay tithings, if I'm going to have to do these and this other thing, how, oh my, what a, see, then that man complaining was put back out again. Amen. Shift for yourself. But if he was, he must be satisfied and no complaining. Oh, how I love to say this. I'm never wanting to go out no more. Oh, it's heaven to me to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with men and women who's fled for their life from the things of the world and anchored their soul in a haven of rest. Oh, what a fellowship. Oh, what joy divine. Leaning on His everlasting arm. Pressure all gone. Not scared of nothing. Amen. For I'm safe in Christ. He is a mighty tower. The righteous run into him and are safe. He's a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. What a place to be. I, I see nothing to complain about. The only complaint I have is, why didn't I do it a long time before I did? I waited till I was about 19, 20 years old. I ought to... Some fellow met me the other day, a young fellow, and I was talking about these... Um, the scandal of uh, these ladies out on the street with these garments don't look like man. And I was laying it on pretty heavy. A young fellow met me out the door. He said, just a minute. And doing this sure uh, shindig, you know, twist, <coughs> breaking their legs and everything. I said, it's insanity. And I said, the real Christian, if that's in their heart and they claim to be a Christian, their, their fruits show what they are. It shows an emptiness for any man or woman to try to satisfy themselves upon stuff of the, of the world. Amen. Amen. They are carrying uh, of the world, trying to satisfy themselves when the Zion is full of beauty and power. Amen. Amen. Satisfied Amen. to let off the pressure. Amen. Why would you change angel food for garlics of Egypt? Amen. Like Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, there's a place to let off the pressure. Come into it. And you'll be safe when you come in there. What a wonderful thing it is to know it. All right. No complaining. This young man said to me, he said, look, Mr. Branham, said you're a man 50 years old said, you don't admire a beauty in the women as you see them walk. I said, said, if you was my age, is about 25. He said, if you was my age, you'd see different. I said, mister, I'd preach in this same gospel years younger than you are now. I just found something that's satisfied. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Something that's real. Something that... Everything else is blind. I'm inside of a tower. I don't have no desires to even look out. He that puts his hands to the plow and even turns to look back is not worthy of the plow. What a place to come. Yes. Outside you die. Inside you're safe. Just come in and let off the pressure. That's the thing to do. And Christ is our tower. Yes, God's provided place of safety. Joshua built those houses and those cities of refuge, and God built us a city of refuge. That's in His Son, Christ Jesus. The name of the Lord is the mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Now you say, what if you get sick in there? He bore our sickness in this tower that we're in. He bore our sickness in His body. We have... Well, you say, what if you get weary when you're in there? All cares and then cast your cares upon Him. 
It's wrote on every wall, Amen. all the way around. Amen. Every door, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Trust in his promised word. His words are written on our heart. Our hearts are the tables of his word. Like Martha and Mary and all along, see? Even death itself doesn't worry you in here when you're in the Lord. Why? He rose from the dead. Amen. We don't have no worry about that. Death comes like the little sister was speaking about there. If it's time to go, let's go. Amen. Right. What do you do? Change this old vile carcass that we got for an immortal body made like into his own glorious body. Amen. Who wouldn't change this pest house for Amen. something like that? Amen. Amen. Tell me somebody that wouldn't. An older person, a younger person. No matter if you're only 15 years old or 12 or whatever it is, death lays at your door. You don't know what time that human heart that beats like this has got to stop someday. Amen. And it might stop when you're 10 years old, 12 years old. It does for the thousands every day. But in here, in the, this body that we're going to exchange it for, the blood don't pulsate it. The Holy Spirit does. Hallelujah. And it can't die. It's immortal, eternal. And it can't die. What a promise. Yes, even death, Paul. Look at Israel. Now there's coming a death shower across Egypt. And God made a provision. He made a refuge for them. And he said, take a lamb and slay it. And put the blood on the little post and on the door. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Egypt laughed at it. But it was a God-provided way from death. And now when those great dark wings of death swept down through the, the city and city after city over all Egypt, and that death started moving into every house and screams coming up, I can see Israel just as relaxed, let off the pressure. <laughs> The little boy might walk up to his father and say, Daddy, you know, I just heard that runner going through the street. Little Johnny that I played with down there, he's dead. Daddy, I'm your firstborn. See the old father raise up, take off his spectacles as it was, lay down his Bible, say, Come here, son. <laughs> Daddy is coming down the street. Let off the pressure, son. Come here, man. You see that blood? Amen. Yeah, I see it, Daddy. Well, let off the pressure. <laughs> Junior, you don't have to speed through the street with your hot rod. You don't have to do these things. Just examine and see if the blood's there. Let off the pressure. If death's knocking at the door, it can't do nothing. Praise. No pressure with Israel. They could let off the pressure because they were safely under the blood. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. That great night of the Passover, they must have been calm. Let off the pressure because they could examine and see they had the blood. And when they seen the blood, they know he promised he'd pass over. Oh, after they had followed all the instructions of God, God promised to pass over them. Now, what a... Picture that is for the church today. Now, I hurry, but I've got to lay this down here just a minute. Amen. Today, we are constantly leaving one congregation to another, taking our papers from one church, our letters to the other. If the Methodists don't do something that you think ought not to be done, you'll take it to the Baptist, from the Baptist to the Presbyterian, from one to the other. See? What's the matter? It just shows that you've never come to that spot yet. Amen. You've never come there where you can let off the pressure. Amen. You're watching something that you ought not to be watching. Christians go from one denomination to another. It shows that they have never come to that refuge. Amen. See, they go away sometime to seminaries. That's all right. And they learn the Word just as close as they can. They come home and they try to talk that word just as close as their denomination. Let them do it. And that's good. But that ain't it. Right. 
Not to know His Word, but to know Him. Him. Well, sure. It's not how much of the Word you know, how good a church we have, what our denomination means to the world, how much exemptions we got by this, and how much fellowship we have with the world, what kind of a crowd we have coming. It's you. Are you under the blood? If you, as an individual, I don't care if every one of the congregation is wrong, you're still secured. You're under the blood. Sometimes God placed you in a congregation that's wrong to shed some light. Don't jump up. Just keep jumping from place to place, from one thing to another. Just stay under the blood. Go to running out, then your security is gone. Stay under the blood. Name is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it, and they're safe. They're off the pressure. See in the hours that we know that there's people that's under that blood. We see to vindicate it. We see God, what He does to vindicate His church. Promise anything when we're in this tower, anything that you ask in my name, I'll do it. If ye abide me in my words, you ask what you will. Amen. You'll be done to you. What a plate. It's written, do all things, whatsoever you do. Do it in my name. Not do it in the name of the church. You say, well, uh, I'm giving a testimony because I'm thankful and I'm Presbyterian. I'm thankful I'm Pentecostal. I'm thankful I'm, I'm, thankful I'm of Christ. Right. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Then in His name, we have fellowship. Now, if we go out here and one says, I belong to the church of God. I believe this is church of God. And the other one says, I belong to the assemblies. Well, that might make a friction. One says, I belong to the United. The other one says, I belong to something else. The oneness or the whatever it is. Uh, if you're going to fuss that way, you're, you're going to fuss. But if you have actually reached that power, no matter what group you're with, you're under the blood, and that's the only place that you can have fellowship. While the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We have fellowship then one with another. What a fellowship it is. We can reach across and take the church of God, the assemblies of God, the oneness of God, and whatever it might be. No matter what it is, there we have things in common. We have Christ. And Christ is our refuge. Each one of us. If he's a Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever he is, if he's under that blood, you can fellowship with him because you are one. You're in this divine fellowship of Christ. Oh, what a great thing. Isaiah described it. He's a rock in a weary land. That's this kind of a land. Where he's so weary, people don't know what to do. They say, well, is this right? Is that right? Christ is right. Is this the way? Is that the way? He said, I am the way. Which is truth, this or that? Jesus said, I'm the truth. Amen. I'm the way, the truth, the life. See, we quit worrying about that. That builds up pressure. You say, is the Methodist right? Is the Presbyterian? My mother was this. And my, uh, but Christ was your Lord. See, Amen. no matter what it is, you build up pressure. And that makes you fuss. See, if you're just depending on your organization, that builds up a fuss. You're trying to build your organization. But if you're in Christ, you just let off the pressure. Amen. There's just food for all of us. Ah. Jacob dug a well and the Philistines run away from him. I believe he called it Strife. I forget the name it was there. And he dug another and they run it away from him and he called that Malice or something. Then he dug another well and he said, there's room for all of us. That's all. We'll come to so I think we need to get around that third well. So in the only way we can do that is under the blood. Then a Methodist can come right in here and feel just at home as a Pentecostal could. Yes, sir. A Methodist pastor filled with the Holy Spirit could take every Pentecostal country right in there and be right at home. And we can be at home with one another. Not because, say, now all you Methodists, all you Pentecostals, when you say, all you Christians, amen. (laughs) Oh, that takes in the big thing. Then we have fellowship and just let off the pressure. I like that. There's no pressure built up there. We don't care what you belong to, what brand you wear. I used to herd cattle in the Troublesome River Valley. 
And then if you can raise two ton of hay and on this ranch, why, you can put a cow on the pasture. And some of them man has thousand two head of cattle. Grimes is up there, the bar of diamond bar. Ours is the old turkey track. Well, they, they had uh, many brands, maybe 20 or 30 brands up and down that, uh, that association had in it. Then there's a drift fence that keeps the cattle back up on the national forest as you go up the canyon and keep them up there. And then the riders ride through the summer and put so many bulls, so many cows and so forth. Then we, they have a drift fence. And the ranger stands there to check those cattle as they go through. Sometimes a whole bunch of us would get together when we would bring them cattle up in the spring. And there's literally thousands of head of cattle up and down that valley. How many times have I sat there with my leg wrapped around the horn of the saddle watching that ranger stand there? He's checking those cattle as they go through. Now, I noticed there was about many different kinds of brands went in there, but the ranger never noticed the brand. He watched for the blood tag because nothing can come on that forest but a thoroughbred herfer. Therefore, they keep the breeding rights. Right, I, think. I think that's what's going to be at the day of judgment. God ain't going to say, well, you belong to the sinless church of God. He's going to watch for that blood tag when I... Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Regardless of the brand we got, that don't mean nothing. Are you a Hereford? Are you registered? Are you a born-again Christian? Filled with the Holy Ghost, washed in His blood. That's what God's going to look for with you. See that blood tag. When I see, now when I see the brand, when I see the blood tag, you can pass in. Hey, man, I'm beginning to feel religious. You're almost 1230 and I ought to have been done 20 minutes ago and just getting to feel religious. Good, right, good. Oh, praise God. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Now, for another minute or two, if you will, I'm told that there's a certain type of eagle. Many of you take, man, got my message on the eagle stirs its nest. And uh, I was studying eagles. I like eagles. I know that you think he's an old uh, rascal, but he was here for a purpose. Like if I, I said to my wife, the other day, you all seen in Life magazine, where they killed that 400 and something thousand coyotes last year. Just take them and shot them down. They got a bunch of domestic hogs went wild down here. They're just going to take them in there with airplanes and machine gun them down. That's murder. That's not right. It's not right. That coyote can't help being a coyote. He has to kill to eat. Many times they say he kills off the lambs and things like that. Of that lazy bunch of herders they got up there, when them yoes are lambing, if they get out there and take care of them yoes instead of sleeping up till 10 or 11 o'clock, the coyote would have a better name. That's right. He's not Donnell, the, the mask over his face. He's a coyote, sure. I've seen human beings worse than him. Uh, and the bear, they're always talking about the bear. He's a killer. He kills the calves. I've hunted since I was a little boy, and I've never seen a bear kill a calf. Of course, he would do it. When he's starving to death, you'd do the same thing. Remember, you have to kill to eat. And every day, today, if you live, something has to die so you can live. Right. You kill a cow, it died. You kill the sheep, it died. Say, I don't eat meat. Well, something died anyhow. If you eat a potato, it died. It's a lie. If you eat greens, it died. It's a lie. And a human can only live by dead substance. I get it. And if something had to die in order for you to live physically, is it only sensible that something had to die so he could live spiritually? Christ died. Hallelujah. Not a creed, but a life. They come from Christ. We live eternally amen, amen. through Christ. This eagle, it's a great bird. I haven't got time to unfold it. What he does and how he makes his nest and where he's not like his denominational brother, the chicken, a barnyard scratcher. <laughs> he's going to be sure nothing ain't going to bother his chicken. He goes, way ha! No weasel's going to get him or his young ones. Ah! No wonder God likened his heritage to the eagle. You no, know, he calls himself an eagle. And we're eaglets. And the eagle is not a scavenger. He gets fresh meat every day. Amen. Eagle food. That's what the church has to have. Not only an experience of 40 years ago, an experience I got right now. 
something fresh from heaven. The old eagle builds his nest way up in a cliff so the weasels and things won't get it. His denominational brother, the chicken, <laughs> puts his any old crack of the fence down there. Scratching the barnyard and everything else, but not eagle. He couldn't eat that. He, he's gone. That's nothing for him. This eagle, when he gets to a certain place, the Bible said, renew our youth like the eagle. I often wondered, renew the youth? How could that be? I remember, this sounds, I've taken a lot of your time, but the first Pentecostal group I ever got with was two different uh, organizations of them together, and I was coming down from, from up on a fishing trip. And I went in, I seen these names all over this, and I went in, I heard the awful noise, and these people in there jumping and running and dancing around over the place, and I thought, what is this? So he said, all ministers to the platform tonight, and there's about 300 of us, and we went up, I went up and sat down, said, now we haven't got time for you all to preach. He said, we just want you to just call your name where you're from. When it come to me, I said, William Branham, evangelist, Jeffersonville, Indiana, sat down. So I heard some fine speakers that day, and first thing you know, they had to have it in the north so the color could come to it. It was a national convention. And they had to have it in the north them days. That's been about 25 years ago, I guess, or more. Had to have it up there so the colored people could attend. So that night I thought, my, this great convention, this night's meeting, they'll have one of their most four more speakers to come forth. Of course, us Baptists, you know, that's the way we did it. So they got, after a while, raising up in a corner was an old colored man. An old darky had a little rim of white, white fuzz around his neck. And I was about, I guess, about 22 years old, 23. And they had one of these old preacher coats, one of these old-fashioned cut tail, you know, back in the back, you know, like the swallow. The old fellow come limping out like this, about 80 years old. He got out to... I thought, what would they bring a man like that out at a convention here where about 1,500 people being sitting here and they're one of their speakers to come out like that? The old fellow come out and he said, Well, he says, I'll tell you. He says, I want to take my text from over in Job tonight. <laughs> what was you when I laid the foundation of the world? <laughs> when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. I listened to all those ministers that day, how they'd place the life of Christ in the Scripture, how beautifully I thought some real speakers had spoke that day. And I thought, this poor old crippled up fellow, well, he never talked about what went on on earth. He talked about what went on in heaven. <laughs> and he took him up down there about 10 million years before the foundation of the world and brought him down the horizontal rainbow in the second coming. He was for about two minutes doing that. And when he did, the Spirit hit him. He jumped in the air, clicked his heels together, and said, Glory to God! You ain't got enough room here for me to preach. What, popping off the plate? <laughs> I thought, that's what I want. If that'll make an old man act like that, what would it do to me? <laughs> <laughs> Renewing his youth. <laughs> well, he had more room than we got up here at choir and all, and yet they didn't have enough room to hold him when the Spirit struck him. I said, that's what I want. That's what I want. Hallelujah. This old eagle, he gets a crust over his face and head when he gets old. He can hardly eat. He gets poor. His mouth won't open right. He gets almost blinded. And when that crust gets to a certain spot over his head, they say he flies way up in the air. And he sits there and he beats his head against that rock, knocking that crust off if he can. And he rolls his eyes and looks back. He beats the crust. Boy, it must come off. It's got to come off. If it don't, he's going to die. He's got to get that crust off of his face and his mouth. And he beat his head one way and then the other way. He beats until he beats that crust off. And when he beats it against that rock until the crust comes off, then he screams. And he throws his wings back and forth and rejoices because he knows he's going to get new feathers. He's going to eat his vitamins again. He's going to renew his youth. And I thought, what a wonderful thing that is for the eagle. That's good. But I know a rock that a man can come to and 
can be they be beat until the, all the doubt is gone, until the weary and cares of the world is gone. And when he's beat the crust of sin from around him, until the blood has sanctified his soul, then eternal life sure to come. He can just sit back and let off the pressure because eternal life is sure. Oh, eagles today. That's why you're here. You're eaglets. But if the crust has begun to blind your eye, the cures of the world, or you can't just swallow all the food of God, let's come to that rock in a weary land. Let's come there and beat upon the altar until a crust is broke and our eyes can see clearly Jesus again. Amen. And the cures of this world has passed away. Then the pressure will go off. He's a rock in a weary land. A shelter in a time of storm. A refuge, a haven of rest for the weary. Let's come to that place. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Sorry to have kept you long. It was about... Six sheets more of these notes laying here. A little thoughts and scriptures I was going to use, but it's time. Oh, little eaglet. Maybe some little girl, some little boy. Or maybe some old person or middle age. Why are you here this morning? Because that you, you're really an eagle. But maybe the cares of life has kind of battled you around roughly. And you've lost sight. You're not too sure no more where you're placing your foot. Let's just come up against the rock now. Oh, lead me to that rock that's higher than I. Let me lay on this rock. He's a shelter in a time of storm. Start beating against the door right now. Beating against the door of this rock. He'll open up. The crust will fly off. Then the pressure will leave. You can be at rest again. Pressure all gone. You can come to church. No matter what the pastor preaches about, as long as he stays in that Word of God, he'll never condemn you. You've done anchored in there. You're all right now. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I want to express in, Lord, in thanksgiving that there is a little place here in Phoenix and all around different places and this is one of them. That I, myself, I, I can come and I, I can feel at rest. There's nothing binding me. I, I just say the words. What a place that is. Free. All pressure gone. I'm so thankful for it, Lord. Oh, Lord, may that great rock ever lay at this altar. Or the little wayward eaglets around over the city can come in and be introduced to a place to beat the crust of the world from it. That they can enjoy this fellowship by letting off the pressure. And this day of atomic age when the world is scared, each nation is shaking, the skies are trembling, all nature's crying out. The world itself is trembling because it could be blowed to bits. But we have a kingdom that cannot be moved. We have a city of refuge. We have a Goshen where the sun will never go down. Grant it, Lord. Let us come to this rock now. As a little rabbit, the story of he, the hounds is right behind him. He could feel their hot breath upon his feet. Just a little while, another jump or two, and the hound was going to get the little fella. He'd be gobbled up just in a moment. But after a bit, he saw a hole in a rock. And he thought, if I can only get to that rock, then I'm safe. Just as a dog made the last jump at him, he felt his hot breath on his heels, but he ran under the rock. 
And then he could sit down and let off the pressure. The hound could not scratch through that rock. Lord Jesus, I pray to thee this morning, Lord, that if some of these little creatures of yours that's wandered away from that safety zone, they can feel the, the breath of the hounds of hell, young women, young men, galloping right behind them, seeing their life breaking away to the other side. May they hurry this morning to this cleft in the rock. There is one. The righteous run into it and are safe. Granted, Father, through Jesus, thy Son, while we have our heads bowed, and your hearts bowed, too, would you, if you're not in that rock this morning, would you raise your hand to God and say, God, let me come into that safety zone now, that where I can just let all the pressure. I've been a little weary. I begin to see myself drift. I felt myself get away. I haven't got the experience that I used to have. Get me back to the rock right quick, Lord. Would you just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you. That's good. All around, everywhere. Ah, oh, that's good. God bless you. Take me back to the rock, Lord. Take me back. I'm drifting. Oh, don't let me drift away from it. Let me do. If I'm going to eat, let me eat around the cliff. Let me stay close where the manna is falling. I don't have to wander out. The manna is laid right at the door. Heavenly Father, thou didst see this group of hands. I pray that you will give to them their desire. May all the crusts that's begin to blind them now, Lord, as their hearts are beating and their spiritual heart is beating, break away all doubt, all unbelief, all confusion, all nervousness, and, and wondering what's this or that, all wearies. May just now they sweetly find that the crust is being broken. As they hammer their prayer against the rock, may Christ bring them up high now and set them up on a pinnacle. And they can flop their little spiritual wings and say, I'm free, I'm free. Grant it, Father, in Jesus' name. And now is there those here this morning who are in that refuge and you're sick and you don't know just what it's going to be the outcome, and you want to get anchored in something that will give you security, that will heal your body, and want to be remembered in prayer. Just remember, just a word of prayer, that's all. Drive down a little post there where you're sitting and say, this day, this day the prayer of faith was prayed for me, and every time that I enter this church, I'll remember where I was sitting this morning. There the prayer of faith was prayed by the whole congregation for me. I'm going to be well now. This is it. I'm settling. Now raise up your hand saying, I'm driving down my post right now. God bless you. Now remember, by faith, drive down the post right now, right where you're sitting. This day, Sunday, the 10th, I believe it is, or the 13th, this 13th day of January, in this little church of God, at this certain seat, I'm praying the prayer of faith with the minister and with the evangelist and with the congregation, one praying for the other. Uh, this is the day of my healing right here. I'm settling it right here, Lord. I'm your eagle. I'm in the refuge zone. I have a right to any redemptive blessings that he purchased for me. Here I am right here now. Heavenly Father, I bring them to Thee. I place my prayer with theirs. And now by faith we lift from this church on up above the spheres and the atmospheres and spheres and spheres, on up past the stars, moon, up the milky white way, up to the throne of God our Father. There's a great rainbow across that beautiful Ivory altar. There lays on that altar a bleeding sacrifice. And we look upon his back as the prophet bid us to and said, By his stripes we were healed. Father, I'm bringing every one of them to you. 
And he said himself, if you'll ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, Father God, I'm praying for these sick people. They drove down a post this morning. I'm believing it with all my heart. This is the hour for the prayer of faith. And I believe as I asked you to heal every one of them, they accepted it. Here we have the post as a commemoration that was at the throne of God this morning. It's settled. God made the promise. Now, Lord, it's written in St. Mark, the 11th chapter, in the 22nd verse, the 23rd. If you say to this mountain, be moved, don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass, you can have that what you said. Lord, it has been said, now let it be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I accept it for each one and for your glory. Now believe with all your heart and with our heads bowed. Let's sing this old hymn of the church. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. And he purchased my salvation on Calvary. Do you accept that your healing, your salvation, your renewed spirit coming into the house of refuge? You accept it? Raise up your hand. Say, I accept it. I believe it. Right now I do. All right, all together now. I Let's worship him now. I love. Thank you, Lord, for taking the scales from my eyes. Because he first love all my coldness has faded away now. My sickness is gone. Purge just my salvation on Calvary. Now while we sing that again, I want you just to to take hold of somebody's hand front of you, back of you, at your side. Say, God bless you, pilgrim, brother, sister. Glad to have this fellowship with you. Continue to pray for me when you do that. Now, while we sing again now. turn to service to the pastor. Let's just raise up our hands now and with all of our heart sing it to the depths of our soul. Do you love him? Say amen. 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 Let's say it again. Amen. amen. That means so be it. I love him. Amen. All together now. Let's sing it to the top of our voice. I love him. I Sorry, I'm going to 